Greetings from the road. Uh, this is a first. I've been, I've been doing this since 2006. I'm at an undisclosed location. And what you're seeing is a private collection of an extraordinary group of gentlemen. And uh, we're gonna interview one of them here right now. You guys may recognize his name. But I'm, I'm being granted access here by Mr. Ed Archer. And if you know anything about Ed Archer, he's a, he's a living legend in the Model T community. And I'm gonna sit down with him and we're gonna interview him and talk to him about how he got into Model T's. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ed. And Ed, why don't you just tell us how you got into, you know, invested and interested in the hobby? Well, uh, I don't know, I, I, you know, I don't think any of us know what really got us started in, in, a, in a certain area of a hobby or an interest that we have. And, and I'm not sure where mine stems from. It may stem from my parents, uh, who, my father was born in 1904, so the 1920s was his heyday. And it always sounded so grand and so, so much fun. And maybe that's where I picked it up from, uh, the interest in the 1920s. And if you're interested in the 1920s, the Model T was the epitome of, of you know, of the 1920s. It was Americana. And so you're, you gotta have a Model T. That's just part of, uh, of, of life for that era. And, and so I guess that's kind of what got me started in, in the hobby was I, I want, I've always wanted a Model T. So I got my first Model T when I was in high school and um, I'm still stuck on them. And, and along with the Model T, of course, if, you know, if you're into the era and you're into the cars, you're gonna pick up a few derelict other type of cars. There were other makes made other than Ford. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's a part of it. But for me, uh, and, and I, you know, I never, I don't think I ever thought I would ever have a house and a furniture and everything else from that era. But the when I got started in the hobby, with an antique car, I always felt like if you're gonna drive one of these, you need to look the part. And if you're gonna look the part, that means, you, you know, I, I always, when I would see a parade, for instance, and there was a horse's carriage in there, and the guy was wearing what I'm wearing, a short sleeve shirt, and maybe even a pair of short pants. Uh, it's like, what does that, that, it made no sense to me. I always felt like, if you're gonna drive the car, you need to have the right attire, and antique clothes, whatever it is, so that, you know, you're, you're just, uh, the package is there. So, I'll uncover this. Now you can recognize them, <laughs> and, and Ed goes a step further. So We're not anyway, just talking about yeah, the clothes. Yeah, so I grew the mustache. I, I started growing my mustache when I was, I guess, 20, 21 years old. Now, when did you adopt the lifestyle? Tell folks about well, the it, house you live in it, and the lifestyle that you maintain, yeah. because it doesn't just start and stop with the clothes that you put on in the morning or the car you drive. Even when I was in high school, um, yeah, I, I learned to play the ukulele. I actually learned to play the ukulele when I was in the sixth grade, actually. Um, and, uh, and when I was in high school, um, I, I was looking for a brass bed. I just thought, oh, I'd love to have an antique brass bed. So in my bedroom, when I, I was still living at home with my parents, I had a big brass bed. And, uh, and then uh, a friend of mine had a Model T Roadster. This was when I was a senior in high school. He had a Model T Roadster. And, um, and that was when I thought, I rode with him a couple of times and I thought, I gotta have clothes. I can't, can't. I can't ride looking like this. I gotta have the antique. So that's when I started buying clothes, 
And in high school. In high school. Vintage clothes. Yeah, vintage clothes. We went over to the Cliff House in San Francisco, and in those days, down in the lower section, they had a clothing, an antique clothing place, uh, mainly dealt in formal wear, tails and tuxedos, and but all, I mean, in those days, you know, late 1800s, turn of the century, clothes. So that's when I bought my first clothes. And then at that point, my father still had some of his clothes from the 1920s. And, uh, and I, so he gave me his, uh, and that was kind of the beginning. And then I, I got lucky, I met the right woman. I mean, you know, in those days, when you were 17 or 18, you're thinking of, who am I gonna marry? Today, they can be in their 30s, and they're still not interested in getting married. Right. But, you know, so I met the right woman. Uh, we got married on her 18th birthday, March, uh, January 31st. And um, she loved what I was doing, and she just got right into it. And we started shopping for antique clothes and, uh, and, and, and cars and uh, and we used to love looking at Victorian homes, thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice to own one of those? We couldn't afford one, but uh, we thought, boy, wouldn't that be great? Well, we were renting in those days, this is in the early 1960s, late 50s, early 60s. We were renting and, uh, and yeah, we would admire these Victorian homes. Well, 1963, a friend of mine kept telling me I was crazy to be renting a house I should be buying. And uh, I kind of ignored him, but anyway, he sicked a, uh, uh, a real estate woman onto me. <laughs> <laughs> and she called and I, and I said, yeah, I said, okay, yes, I would buy a house, but I said, it's gotta be at least 50 years old or more. So she called me on several houses. I never went and looked at any of them because they were all newer. Uh, finally, one morning she called and she said, there's a house in Hayward. She said, we know it's at least 50 years old. Uh, and would you like to look at it? I said, yeah, let's go look. So we went and looked and we bought it. And it was probably built in the 1870s. Um, and anyway, uh, we just, started building from there kept collecting antique clothes and furniture and so forth and and um finally finished the restoration of the house and uh we restored the house just to explain you know what do you do with a victorian house we restored it to the, to about the 1910 time period that way we could have running water instead of going out to the outhouse and electricity uh, so uh, that's kind of what, where we are. So that's the house that you live in today. That's the house we live in today. We never, you know, I'm lucky. Ha, you're extremely I, lucky. I didn't buy a builder house to where you, you buy it and then you move to another house. Right. And then I move to another. Right. You know, we bought the house and any, I have to admit, when we bought it, it was like, yeah, I don't know. Do we really, <laughs> do we really want it or not? We weren't sure, so it wasn't like this. Oh wow, this is so neat. No, we just thought, well, yeah, I guess we should. Yeah, let's buy it, and um, and we were in it a week, and the friend that had sick this uh, real estate woman onto me loved the house, and he he offered us a thousand dollar profit. And in those days, in those days, 1963, that a thousand bucks was a lot. I, I could have bought another restored Model T for so a thousand bucks. You've been in that house now, so we, assuming that you bought it yep, in 63, 63 for 58 years. So 58 years and uh, same house. Yeah, same house. And so we I love it. I, I got to tell you, because it just struck me. I've done interviews and this is for my living legend interview and I don't do a lot of these. I've never met anyone <laughs> that's been in the same house for 58 <laughs> years. And I've never met anybody that stayed there from a relatively young age. Yeah. And then yeah. all this time, now tell folks, folks are probably gonna guess this, because to me, this is a natural. 
So what did you do? I'd ask you during your working life, what you did for a living. And I think this will come as no surprise to folks out there, but I'm going to ask folks, look at Ed, take a moment. <laughs> what do you see him doing? What, what line of work do you see Ed being in given his love of the period? And I'm going to take a pause here and I'm going to have everybody just put it in their head. Now you got an idea? Okay, Ed, tell folks what you did during your gainful employment years. Uh, I was in uh, I was in the ice cream industry. <laughs> <clears throat> Manufa my my father was a was a route salesman. Well, goes back. My father started in the in the ice cream business and I and I say that he didn't start in the ice cream, but he went to work for an ice cream company, I should say, in the late 1920s uh, in the, for the Gloria Ice Cream Company out of Stockton. And so then he moved to Oakland and worked for Gordon's for a while. And, uh, and then got, he was the first raw salesman for Dryers and Edie's Grand Ice Cream. So for me, I completed high school. I had no thoughts of going to college. That wasn't in our family makeup, like a lot of families, you know, gotta go to college. My, my family makeup was like, you gotta finish high school. You know, <laughs> you know you finish high school. Excuse me. I can relate to that. <laughs> you, finish, yeah, you know, you finish high school and you're done. Right. And so then you go to work. Well, so right. I went to work uh, a couple of different places before I actually went to work for Dryer's Grand Ice Cream. Um, but I think in uh, 50, probably 1959, I started with Dryers. My goodness. Uh, and as a part, a part time, they needed a Saturday driver to, to deliver ice cream to the local restaurants and so forth. And so I worked for them. And then I, I, when winter time came a couple of years later, I got laid off because in the winter time, you don't sell a lot of ice cream. So right. We don't need you. Uh, anyway, I went to work for Foremost and spent several years there and then eventually went back to Dryers and uh, in the promotional uh, part of the of the ice cream business doing promoting throughout the United States for Dryers and Easy Scrounge ice cream. And would, wouldn't you wouldn't you trust this guy to buy ice cream from? I sure as hell would. When he told me this, it just seemed like a natural <laughs> fit. It it seemed like that may not be the first thing you were thinking of, but it was a close second because sure. he seems to be a guy that, you know, I mean, let's face it, Winfred Brimley, I think his name, he's already the Quaker Oats guy. So it's either, it's either he's selling Quaker Oats or he's going to sell ice cream. And I, I would buy ice cream from you. I think it's a, it's a good fit for you. And it's certainly fit for the period that you chose to live your life in. It's a, it's a fun business to be in, let me tell you. Right, and, right. And, and one of the things that at Dryers and Edie's Grand Ice Cream was, if we're not having fun, you need to go work somewhere else. Right, right. So your love of Model T's continued to bloom and blossom, yeah. and folks can't see, but behind you, I'm gonna give them just a little taste. There's a local mobile back there, and. That's one of Ed's cars, is a local mobile. And he actually found that, of all places in California, where you wouldn't expect to find a local mobile. So like I've I've learned over the years, I told Ed, the Model T is just a gateway drug, if you will. It, it leads to more fascinating things and infinitely more fascinating individuals. And this is a case in point. Ed is known for his flamboyant yellow speedster and, uh, I guess Ed, that can do 100 miles an hour. It can, believe it or not. Yeah, and I've uh, I, I can attest that Ed Ed isn't afraid to approach higher speeds. So, uh, well, Ed, you know this is very fascinating. We're coming up on 15 minutes. You and I are going to get up and we're going to kind of walk out. And again, this is a private, undisclosed location. This is a gentleman's club, if you will, for fine cars of every make and model. I've never been into a place like that. I feel very privileged to be able to share this with you folks out there. This is part of what I get to see and do in the course of my travels. And I've got the best job, if you will. I meet the most fascinating people. I, I've never had a chance to sit down and talk with Ed. I hope I see him again. Uh, but this is a 
he's a one of a kind guy and his whole life has been living the period. And, and uh, you know, I've never met anyone quite like him before and I probably never will again, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna step up here and we're gonna kind of walk her out to the front and we're gonna give you guys uh, just another view here. So I hope everybody has had a good week. This is a good, a good mid-week thing for me, a good treat, a good surprise. Uh, I love what I get to do and I love the people I get to meet. And uh, this wouldn't be possible without the kindness and generosity of people like Ed Archer. I mean, gosh. I'm just honored and privileged and very appreciative of the opportunities that are extended to me. Well, I hope everybody out there has a good rest of the week. Thank you very much, Mr. Archer, for taking the time to visit with me. I hope everybody else uh, is enjoying this. Share it and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.